So he madly does repair cafe Bang, Bang, uh, Bengaluru. Mm. Um, so he is a trustee at Repair Cafe Bangalore Foundation, and Himadri is part of a team of volunteers who help spread the message of repairing and reusing domestic items to organizing pop-up workshops in communities. So Himadri graduated from the Master in Human Settlements uh, from um, Catholic Universities in Leuven in Belgium in 12, 2012. And today, um, Himadri is presenting a preview of Right to Repair in India. So really looking forward to your presentation, Himadri. Thank you so much for joining us today. And um, yes, please go ahead. Welcome. Thank you, Bridget, and thank you, James, uh, for having me here to speak. Um, I, uh, so I just quickly, oops. So I, um, I mean, this, uh, it's, it's something which everybody knows, so I'm not really going to spend much time, but uh, the idea is meaning of repair. I mean, for, for a moment, just looking back into what does repair really mean, because uh, you tend to get lost in a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of discussions and debates um, which are around repair. And they pull us in different directions, but uh, I think uh, from here, this definition, which uh, Dennis Rieke has put together in a paper, and it says uh, basically uh, repair is something that helps to uh, bring something back to its original function. So uh, that's I thought was important. So that's the first thing. Now, um, so uh, while uh, there is a discussion about um, right to repair, uh, there have been some draft rules which have been um, uh, formulated uh, in India as well. Um, the, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, in, in India, I'm specifically talking about India, we do not have a statutory right to repair. It is in process uh, and uh, it will take some time to get there. But uh, we know that the consumer is uh, frustrated by uh, controls which are exercised by you know, manufacturing, manufacturers uh, acting through uh, limitations on tools, on the knowledge or manuals which allow repairers to, or treat third party repairers to conduct repairs and also on technology and hardware, so hardware and software. So these are uh, some of the ways by which uh, the controls are exercised. Uh, so, and what's interesting also, at, at, at the same time, we are talking about um, repair and you know, right to repair, which is sort of uh, trying to open the whole uh, arena um, uh, to allow for uh, um, repair to happen. Uh, at the same time, there is uh, something called informal repair, which, uh, as you can see, there are markets in cities, and they literally work like, um, you know, shops which are selling uh, spares. And um, uh, you could you could probably find a spare over here uh, that uh, would at the original would be found uh, in a in an OEM, which is a original equipment manufacturer. So. The informal sector is, you know, sort of uh, has, I would say, I would not say that the informal sector has filled up the hole, uh, the gap, which is uh, there because of um, all the restrictions um, from the manufacturers. But to a certain extent, uh, the, the informal, uh, informal uh, repairs are doing a good job. And they are, they are sort of, taking advantage of the restrictions which are there because of uh, because the restrictions which are there because of the uh, manufacturers uh, to, to sort of explore the market. Now, um, so with that background, um, what is, how would right to repair, uh, you know, how would it be relevant and how would it be relevant for an individual such as you or me, 
uh, who is uh, basically has is a consumer and uh, has a product and uh, they want to get it repaired so that they can extend its life you know and that's the basic thing so it's on one hand it's sort of if we talk about the legislations it it, it is looking like a struggle between uh, you know the OEMs and there are some antitrust regulators so um, you know what we are talking about here is something for example which is called a competition commission of india so what this uh, body does is uh, it's sort of like a watchdog that <clears throat> presides over the industry in trying to figure out that is anybody having an unfair position of advantage um, therefore the name the competition commission so the if there is an unfair competition that has to be called out by these guys. And um, so there is a sort of like a legal struggle which is happening between the original equipment manufacturers, which may be uh, in case of cars, it may be Honda or Fiat uh, or Toyota or whatever. And uh, on the other hand, these kind of regulators who are there to make sure that uh, individual manufacturers don't enjoy uh, unfair competition. So that's uh, that's where we are today. There is there is already this kind of struggle, which is there between the OEM and the antitrust regulators. So the regulators argue that uh, the consumers uh, are only aware of. So uh, the regulators say that look, uh, there are two markets. There's primary market and there is a secondary market. Primary market is where you, if you go to buy a car, it's where you buy the car. And the secondary market is where you'll find uh, tools, spares, and other things to repair the, uh, repair and refurbish or whatever to extend the life uh, of the product which is bought from the primary market. Now the argument here. Uh, that the uh, that the commission or this watchdog is making is that when I as a consumer go to buy uh, such a product, I do not have a good perspective of the secondary market. So, uh, which means that the when I'm going to spend money to get some a product, uh, I am not able to assess how much money am I going to spend in the total life cycle uh, of that product. So based on that, there have been cases which are brought and uh, manufacturers have been told that look, uh, you have to make uh, this transparency so that uh, people or the consumers are able to have a good perspective of not only the primary market where you buy the cars or any other electrical equipment, but also the secondary market, which is where all the repair and the other things happen. So that's where it's sort of uh, going on. And there is, uh, what's interesting is there is, uh, there has been already some precedents by which um, cases have been won. So there is something called the Consumer Act. So uh, if you can see, um, sorry, uh, I don't have it here, but there is something called the Consumer Protection Act based on which uh, cases have been fought and won. So uh, it's uh, in the absence of a proper statutory regulation, uh, there is the Consumer Protection Act, uh, which uh, is able to give some protection to the individuals like myself or like everybody else. Now that's when you have a brick and mortar industry. In the case of software, it goes further because this whole concept of planned obsolescence, uh, it can be programmed uh, by writing the code. And, um, it, you know, it turns out that there is something called uh, the Pro uh, Copyright Act of 1957, which is an Indian Act. And apparently that says that it's legal uh, to write such a code. Um, so that means that if we're talking about right to repair, uh, amendments would have to be made to that act as well. Um, um, then, like I, I want to sort of 
I mean, this is this is the last slide, so we can just go back to discussions. It's, uh, I know it's a bit, um, it, it's a little there are too much of layers of information here. But what I want to say is that if the right to repair does come in, we need to empower a large majority of the informal repairers or third-party repairers by supplying them manuals, tools, uh, training, and all that. So, uh, right to repair cannot. Uh, ignore this huge informal sector economy which exists in this country and uh, you'd be surprised to know that you know 90 percent of the jobs uh, in the in the whole uh, in any sector is actually informal economy jobs in India which means that if if one is talking about informal sector that accounts for 90 percent of the jobs not 90 percent of the the amount of the gross domestic product, but the number of jobs. So that makes it a very, very significant number. Uh, and, and therefore, a very, very significant uh, issue to deal with um, this whole informal sector. Um, it's a wide range of things to be considered. I, I think I'll stop here. If there are, if I, if, if I need to explain something better, uh, I can do that. Fantastic and fascinating, um, Imadri, that's uh, really amazing. Would you like to um, stop sharing um, your mm -hmm. presentation and then we can see you? Mm -hmm. That's great. All right, here you are. Wonderful. So um, can you please have some questions for some conversation with Imadri? Maybe some ideas that you would like to share from your own experience in your own country? Or what you just learned from Himadri. Mm. Hi, everyone. No, kia ora, Janet. Hi, um, hi from Nottingham. Um, Himadri, I was really interested in all the different angles that you kind of presented for, uh, you know, looking at right to repair in the Indian frame, like the almost like framework. Um, but the one that interests me the most really is the copyright aspects because it seems like. Um, yeah, it seems like that's kind of what holds us back the most in terms of being able to, let's say, make our own spare parts or, you know, re radically reuse stuff. Um, and I know that China has been rather strong on enforcing copyright for the OEMs, um, especially even on things like uh, chips, like computer chips. Um, is that the, is the enforcement as strong in India? and? In other words, I know that you said that, that, that there's a debate happening, but what's the actual practice like on the ground? And is there a space for, let's say, um, circumventing some of these um, strong copyrights on spare parts and equipment? Thank you, uh, Janet. Uh, very good question. Uh, I think uh, this question really uh, addresses um, the situation, how it is on the ground. I, what I would like to start out by saying, which I'm very uh, clear about is that there is a big uh, informal sector, like I said. And uh, there, are, uh, there are things which are happening there, which is in a way circumventing this populace. Um, but that is, uh, th that is, you know, as of today, those are not um, the first thing that you would approach if you have to, you know, it, it's, it's not something, it, it, it could, I mean, if somebody had to scale it up, uh, you couldn't make a, a company out of it because you would fall on the wrong side of the law, right? So um, that's, I think that, that is there. And uh, the enforcement, I, I don't think the enforcement would be so high as, uh, for example, maybe the case in China. Um, but um, it, it's really a question of, you know, what scale are you working at? If, if you're working at scale, then you're bound to come into the radar and then it becomes difficult. Yeah, and I suppose any discussion of it ultimately, you need a business model to, to be, yeah. let's say, refurbishing or manufacturing spare parts. You need scale. So I can see that right. as a problem.
Actually, I, I was uh, quite interested to know from some of you if you, uh, you uh, face um, in other countries uh, this whole thing of uh, informal uh, repair. Hey, um, I might just share this again, you know, like um, this is um, the situation in our country. So, um, yeah, it's <laughs> very limiting, right? Yeah. So, uh, mm -hmm. and um, very challenging, I guess, you know, so, um, and we are just presenting this now, you know, uh, in the submission. So I'm not quite sure where this is going to take us, but it will uh, really take some frank and strong conversations, I guess. Mm -hmm. How are you doing this, Janet? I mean... I'd be keen to learn from you too. Yeah. Well, there's a good question from Marta, but I, I just thought of, um, I'm really struggling with the name, maybe it's brain fog, but um, the, uh, the refurbisher in the US who spent time in jail for sending out CD-ROMs with uh, windows, like basically, um, so anyone, can anyone remember his name in the chat? Um, Microsoft had him prosecuted, well, Dell and Microsoft had him prosecuted for sending out some software which was free, but on a CD, um, because he made the mistake of putting like some kind of logo on the CD. So just to say that, yeah, informal efforts to rescue equipment are still criminalized for the most part, and I would say here and in the US. Um, Anybody trying to circumvent those um, formal copyright structures will be punished for sure. <laughs> yeah. It will be good to hear from, from other countries as well, people who are participating. So there, Maybe there, is, the a question, there, there is a question on uh, warranty periods. Um, yes, um, Marta, uh, the, uh, especially for uh, electric. Uh, what's called white goods and brown goods, um, uh, you know, electrical stuff, uh, automobiles, warranty periods are important. And um, uh, it's people do actually go back to uh, OEMs uh, for uh, during the warranty period. And part, part, primarily because uh, during the warranty period, uh, it, you know, it's uh, more cost effective to, to have uh, replacements. Or even repairs. Um, I, I remember my personal experience, and I think uh, you know I'm, I'm no expert on law, but uh, my experience of repair is what I can speak from. And uh, so, in a in a motorbike, um, I have um, uh, you know a three year warranty period. And uh, uh, when you buy the motorbike, they also say that look, there is an extended warranty. Uh, which takes you for another couple of years. Um, for some reason, I decided to take the extended warranty. And uh, uh, practically one day after um, uh, the three, year, uh, three years of warranty got over, I had a problem with a sensor which, uh, um, which uh, detects the speed of, of the vehicle. And uh, it, it's a very small thing, um, but uh, it's, it's somewhere inside and uh, if it doesn't work, your speedometer doesn't work and a whole lot of other things will not work along with it. And um, I might say that I had an extended warranty and I went back and um, so I was able to get it fixed and practically free. So uh, yeah, there is that advantage uh, of, um, uh, of going back to the OEM for warranties or, and even for extended warranties. This is probably the time we have um, with you, Himadri. I understand. Is that correct? If I get this right, mm, what's the time? <laughs> it's a little confusing. Um, I don't. Uh, thank you so much. This is so interesting, and you're working so hard. I mean, this is just incredible. Do you have support um, in in the work that you're doing? Uh, in the work that we are doing. Uh, we uh, in in Bengaluru, we are um, we have in sort of like uh, people who are enthusiasts, volunteers, and we have uh, about fifteen people. And um, actually, uh, you know, in the previous uh, session, uh, Karen and Danny were there, so 
uh, they were talking about uh, uh, having, uh, you know, bringing in, exposing children to this whole idea of repair. And we, we uh, with, along with Puna and uh, others from the Pay Cafe Bengaluru, we run this program called Timber Kinder. And, uh, uh, you know, it's been, uh, and Karen and Danny also graciously accepted to be on one of the programs uh, last year. So uh, that was, that was nice. And uh, it provided a wider perspective. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, she, she, they said that Timber Kinder was fun. So, I think uh, 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 to answer your question, uh, yes, we do have help, uh, but this is primarily volunteer help. Uh, but there are people who are quite passionate about it, so uh, you don't, you know, they come and help, and we get that. <laughs> oh, beautiful! Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. This is fantastic and very inspiring, and it would be wonderful to keep in touch. Uh, you, you know, and also help in any way we can. Fabulous. Sure. Thank you again.